the endoderm. The endoderm, like many of the other germ layers, require reciprocal inductive events. And this is one of the reasons why the digestive system and the respiratory system are kind of the last ones to develop. Um, up until this point, the cardiovascular system is pretty much doing the job of taking a lot of the nutrients from the yolk to all of the parts of the body. There are parts that will uh, aid in the um, uh, storage of waste and other things and, and getting rid of them. But you don't need your lungs till you're born, and you really don't need a fully functioning digestive system until much later on. I mean, it obviously has to start working out a number of things before you're born, but the respiratory system is, in fact, as we'll show today, one of the last things to develop. Uh, in fact, we'll show how it even uh, is believed to be responsible for inducing labor once it's fully developed and ready to go. Okay, so let's start with the digestive tube because that's what uh, starts first and then the respiratory tube actually buds off from the digestive tube. And these are the two main things that are from the endoderm. So let's look at a side view of the various germ layers and we have Henson's node and the primitive gut in these regions right here. Obviously they're color coded so you can see where the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm are at. Um, so the foregut, midgut, and the hindgut, this is the region that will develop essentially into the digestive tube that will then start taking place uh, or start um, differentiating into the various organs along the digestive tract. As the body continues to form, the position of the heart also plays a key role in things such as where the liver forms and where the pancreas forms and things of that sort. So that's one of the reasons, too, why these organs have to develop first, because there are inductive signals from the heart, from the blood vessels and such that play a key role in inductive signaling of the, over, uh, of the endoderm. If you remember, the endoderm even plays a key role in the beginning um, in, in some induct, induction of the overlying uh, ectoderm, but here's where it plays a major role as far as reciprocal inductive events. So this mid-gut, or this tube right here, is essentially what's going to start forming the digestive system of the organism. You can kind of see that it starts forming into a tube here. So let's look at what this tube ultimately becomes. You have mesoderm all along the length of the endoderm as it starts forming this tube. And there's a very closely associated role of reciprocal induction going on here. So the endoderm naturally secretes sonic hedgehog as an inductive signal. We'll show that in certain parts, this ability to secrete sonic hedgehog is actually repressed by other tissues, such as the blood vessels, that are necessary for things like the formation of the pancreas and whatnot. But overall, the entire ectoderm pretty much is able to um, uh, secrete sonic hedgehog as a paracrine factor and inducing uh, the adjacent mesoderm. So here, the mesoderm will respond to the sonic hedgehog, and there's where Hox genes expression comes into play. Hox genes plays a, a key role in some regions, especially in the formation of the liver, um, as they are expressed along the length of the digestive tube. Then once the Hox genes start being expressed, you, start, you turn on BMPs and FGFs by the mesoderm, and these are then going to signal back to this region, uh, uh, various regions of the endoderm. And this is where you're gonna start getting budding off of some of these organs, such as the pancreas and the liver and the gallbladder uh, that are necessary to, uh, to form in that region. And again, once you start getting a specification of these, these are in turn going to release paracrine factors that will continue to differentiate the mesoderm. So you can see how they just kind of going back and forth, back and forth in this process. But we do know a lot of key genes that are, are involved in the differentiation of many of these uh, uh, parts of the um, digestive tube. For example, you can see these color-coded down here. One in particular that I'm going to make mention of is PDX1 in terms of the, uh, how the pancreas uh, will form, and we'll talk a little bit about the liver as well. But just to go over some of the basic anatomy of what we're dealing with here. The esophagus is, will form and connect with the pharynx, which is the, um, basically where you're going to get both 
food coming down into the esophagus, but you're also going to get a branching off of the trachea where we have the um, epiglottis uh, being able to separate them to, uh, the two between breathing and between you know, not choking on your food and pushing it down the right tube. They're very close uh, to one another when they form, and so you've got to make sure that everything forms properly between the pharynx and the esophagus and the trachea. Otherwise, there are some developmental problems that can exist and where the tubes don't fully disconnect and, and you're not getting proper separation of them. The stomach, obviously, uh, uh, plays a key role in digestion. Um, once the uh, um, acid has broken down many of the uh, much of the material, it'll enter into essentially the small intestines. So you have various regions of the small intestines. One of the things, though, that's critical in this is the pancreas, because the pancreas secretes a number of enzymes that are responsible, um, and this is what we call the exocrine secretion, um, in which it secretes these enzymes to break down your food, lipids, proteins, um, further break down carbohydrates and such and um, that will eventually be absorbed through the small intestines. You get modification of water and other uh, uh, vitamins and such here in the large intestines, and then eventually you have the excretion of whatever's not absorbed uh, in the waste through the rectum and the anus. The liver, it's very difficult to go through all of the functions of the liver, but we are gonna talk a little bit about some of these. Um, there are over 200 functions of the liver alone, but there's a couple key critical ones that we're going to talk about how the cells initially form in the liver and what role they play. The pancreas also has a dual role. It not only secretes enzymes necessary for digestion, but it also has an endocrine factor. You remember what, what, what's that endocrine factor? What are the two hormones? Do you remember? And glucagon. Good. So insulin and glucagon. Insulin, this is where we're going to talk about diabetes today as well. And how, knowing how the pancreatic cells actually develop has given us an understanding of how we might even convert some pancreatic cells back to beta pancreatic cells to try to cure diabetes, type 1 diabetes and issues like that. So this is where uh, some of the application comes into play in terms of uh, treating various diseases. Um, so yeah, there's an endocrine factor of the pancreas in which certain islets of cell, uh, cells will secrete these hormones that will go through the cardiovascular system and are necessary for taking in, uh, uh, for, you know, stimulating other endocrine organs like glucagon does, as well as necessary for take up of glucose such as insulin uh, and its role in that regard. So let's look at the liver and, and the pancreas. They've shown, ironically, that the liver and the pancreas pretty much, even though they form from the same material that has the same potential, it all depends upon what tissue is near it to induce it. For example, they've shown that paracrine factors from the heart are able to induce liver formation, but it blocks the formation of the pancreas. So that's why the position of the heart near the endoderm is absolutely necessary for the inductive process to, to create the liver, and the liver will start budding off from that endoderm to, to be formed. On the reverse side, a region of the notochord actually induces pancreatic formation or the formation of the pancreas cells and blocks liver formation. So the heart and the notochord essentially have uh, op opposing roles, whereas one induces the liver, the other one induces the pancreas, and the heart has been shown to actually suppress pancreas formation if they move some of these signals around and vice versa. What's interesting here, though, is the notochord the endoderm, if you remember what we just went over, naturally secretes sonic hedgehog. And so the notochord is able to repress sonic hedgehog in that region of the endoderm, and that's where the pancreas start forming. Now, do you, anybody see anything strange about this or think anything strange about this? Yeah. So the notochord secretes sonic hedgehog, which normally has a positive feedback loop. But in this situation, the secretion of sonic hedgehog by the notochord actually represses sonic hedgehog formation in the endoderm. It's pretty fascinating. It works contrary to what we uh, would normally think would happen. So those are the two necessary regions. Now, there are other things involved in this process as well, as you'll see in just a second. One of the things 
they've also shown is you have these forkhead proteins um, or genes that are transcription factors that play a key role in both liver and pancreas formation. One in particular of these forkhead factors they've shown to be related to type 2 diabetes. Um, and so this is where they're looking, you know, as far as people who would develop type 2 type diabetes is there's a genetic mutation in one of these transcription factors that gives them a predisposition to develop type 2 diabetes. So what happens? Well, here in the endoderm, or in this primitive gut, you have, as the blood vessels are forming, you have secretions that ultimately cause uh, a P PDX1 induction. In fact, the pancreas will form on both sides and then kind of wrap around and eventually become one organ. So that's what you're seeing here is induction on both of these sides. What you see is you get a ventral pancreatic bud and a dorsal pancreatic bud, and eventually they will connect together. Now the two main regions here is the vent ventral pancreatic duct um, typically has the exocrine um, cells that will secrete many of the enzymes that are necessary, and this region will have many of the endocrine cells, the islets of Langerhans, um, that have the beta pancreatic cells that secrete insulin, um, and then you have uh, gamma cells and alpha cells, and these are uh, key cells that are looked at in development in terms of when you get things like type 1 diabetes, where typically the beta pancreatic cells are destroyed, they're showing that there is a key gene that gets, uh, uh, typically can be turned off that uh, um, keeps them as beta cells, that they can actually convert alpha cells into beta cells. And so there are still things that they have to look at to, to, to figure out why the beta cells are being destroyed and, and such. It's not just the genetic mutation in the insulin that causes type 1 diabetes. A lot of times it's the cells themselves are not producing insulin. But if we can, in an adult, convert the alpha cells into the beta cells, we could potentially have a cure for type 1 diabetes for those affected in that situation um, in that regard. So this is a key thing that they're trying to understand in terms of how the pancreas develops so that we can possibly treat some of these problems that come about um, uh, from the pancreas in an adult. The liver, again, forms as a result of the heart paracrine factors. The pancreas is a result of the notochord blocking, son uh, uh, blocking uh, sonic hedgehog uh, secretion. It's not actually the blocking of sonic hedgehog that causes the pancreas to form, however. It's the induction by the blood vessels that then um, once sonic hedgehog is downregulated in this tissue, then they can respond to the inductive tissues of the blood vessels that are surrounding that area to cause the pancreas to start forming. They've shown this to be the case that uh, it's not, the gut is typically not competent to respond to some of these signals from the blood vessels uh, unless sonic hedgehog is actually downregulated by the notochord in those particular regions. All right, and then the gallbladder will also form as a result. It's not an essential organ, but it does concentrate the bile, which is necessary for emulsifying your fats that come in through your digestive system and being able to allow the enzymes to digest those fats. If you remove your gallbladder, eventually your liver will actually take over, so to speak, so there is kind of a recovery period from that. Uh, even though the liver does make the, gall, uh, the bile, the gallbladder will store it uh, and secrete it as necessary, but it's not absolutely essential. Um, you know, when you have problems with your gallbladder, you can remove it without any um, huge side effects. There is a change in diet initially, but usually can, functionality can be restored as a result of uh, prolonged loss of it. So... This is ultimately the outline of what the single digestive tube becomes. The stomach, the liver, the pancreas, the gallbladder, all of these organs bud off from that endoderm. So you don't have endoderm that's actually being pushed out and then forming into these. It's actually budding off and then forming these connections um, because of their role. Um, so it starts out as one long tube. Most of it stays as one long continuous tube, but you do have the accessory organs, the liver, the pancreas, and the gallbladder
that are derived uh, as a result of these inductive signals. So again, the liver from the heart, the uh, pancreas from the notochord, and uh, I don't even remember what the gallbladder, <laughs> what induces the gallbladder. I'm not sure if that was even in your book. But anyway, it's a difficult process, too, because this has to fuse with the pharynx, and then ultimately it fuses with the ectoderm to form the anus. And then much of the um, mesoderm that is surrounding the endoderm that's causing this reciprocal induction, a lot of that is going to form into smooth muscle that are necessary for peristalsis. What's peristalsis? It's essentially the contraction and squeezing and pushing the, uh, the food down the esophagus and through the stomach and through the small intestines and whatnot. That is, uh, so it not only serves as the muscle for that, but also inductive tissue along that axis, as I went through earlier. Just to kind of recap it again, one of the reasons why the endoderm is one of the last ones to, to form is because the mesoderm that surrounds it, one, has to differentiate to a point where uh, um, it will be able to respond to the inductive tissue of the endoderm, but at the same time, um, uh, much of the cardiovascular system and these other systems have to develop before even any of these develop, otherwise there will be no inductive signal. All right, so this is probably one of the least understood developmental processes. It's one of those that we're still investigating quite a bit about. We don't know as much as we know, say, about many of the other systems that we do. As such, you know, as we're starting to find out more about these genes that are responsible and how these stem cells come about, then we can actually start looking at how to treat um, various problems in adults that come about, such as type 1 and type 2 diabetes, and how to um, try to use various therapies, whether gene or stem cell therapies, to remedy that. 